for this is eternal life, that they may know you as the only true God and whom you have sent, the messenger, Jesus Christ. So Christ is even referring to himself as a prophet. So what we're observing is that this concept of being fully human, fully God, was something which developed later on in Christian history in various councils. I'm not sure if you're familiar with church history, but certain, yeah. So this understanding of God the Son, that really took its understanding of the second person of the, of the Trinity based upon the, the, the Greek or Roman world, which was prevalent at that time, contemporary to Christ that 2000 years ago. And so the New Testament was written in Greek, even though Christ didn't speak Greek. Yeah, spoke, spoke a, a, a dialect of Aramaic. So what we, what we then say is essentially, if we look, examine the New Testament, this human, the point that you made initially, fully human and fully God, 100%. But it doesn't make that, it doesn't make that claim. So it was a way of philosophers later contemplating who could Christ possibly be. So due to the Hellenistic Greek influence that incorporated itself within the writings of the New Testament, and they then you know, made this philosophical understanding based upon this particular chap called um, Plotinius, a very famous philosopher and, um, and theologian who tried to reason like, and understand that there's a, there is God, there is the universe, there's, and there is his intellect. So this, formula, this Greek or Roman formulation then formalized itself within this trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And this then incorporated itself within later Christian belief due to the influence of the Greek or Roman world. Because when Christ came, he came amongst the, the Jews who were essentially monotheists, but the, the prevailing, those who were in prevailing positions of dominance at the time were the, were the Romans and the Greeks. And their concept of divinity would entail creation. So a human being would be referred to as a, as a, as a god. Like, probably read about Augustus Caesar or those emperors who would be given such honorific titles. So it's as a consequence of that, that these later eulogies, eulogy means like, like an enhancement on Christ's character become personified. But for example, I've given you those verses from within the New Testament in which he highlights who, who God is, one supreme being. We as Muslims, this is what we believe. We believe an almighty God who is unlike his creation. So he's not a man, he's not a woman, he's not an idol, he's not a statue, statue rather, he's completely unlike his creation. And that's, that's our concept of who God the Father would be for Christians. Um, do you believe that like, humans were created in the image of God? So what we believe, I mean, I, I think you're referring to Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, which make, I think, even it says over there, let us make man in our image. So that man in Hebrew is Adam. So it was like God makes attributes of man in his image because it also says in the Bible, of that Lord make no graven image. So hence we can't give manifestation of creation to God. So image is in the sense of, of one, it's a, it's a Greek word called icon or icon. You know where we get the word icon? Yeah. It comes from that Greek word called icon. Which, which literally means like an expression of God's word, manifest itself in the, in the form of a human being. That's what it actually means. So when it says, let us make man, man in Hebrew is Adam. So Adam, what it's actually saying, Adam was made in the image of God, but you don't believe, of course, that Adam is literally God. And I think it's mentioned in, in Ephesians and in Colossians as well, that um, the Christians, I think it's Ephesians chapter three, verse 19, if I'm not mistaken, which says that even Christians are in the image of God. But that doesn't make them God. It just literally means that God's representation is exalted within those human beings who God has guided. What do you think? So the Islamic personification, it makes it much more sensible in the sense that a creator doesn't have to be like his creation. If you think about the universe, for example, you're already a Christian, so you already believe in God. But commonly when we speak to atheists, and we ask them to reflect upon the possibility of a creator. You know, a universe from nothing doesn't make sense. Um, did the universe create itself? That wouldn't make sense. There had to be something right from the off, yeah. which is metaphysical beyond the universe. So the Islamic perspective is that creator is beyond the universe. As myself and, uh, and you speak, if I put my hands out this way, what have we got? We've got in between us, we've got time, matter, space, energy, all the uh, um, elements as a result of the creation of the universe. 
But what was there before that is incomprehensible. But what we do know is that it was comprehensible in the sense that someone created it. Yeah. Something has created it, you see. So hence, what we say, God is unique in that sense. Of that, Lord not make no graven image. Um, so Jesus himself, like I said, was a, a, a man who did wonders, works and signs that God did through him. That's in the book of Acts, chapter 2. So God then chooses select individuals as his particular representatives who do his work. So it becomes incumbent upon us then to follow that individual because that's the way to attain closeness to God. So for example, where Christ says, like in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man come through the Father but through me. What he's saying, you, you have to follow him in order to reach the destination. Because he's not claiming to be the destination, rather the way to the destination of one who needs to get close to God. Make sense? Yeah. Another one I can show to you. And I'm, I'm only just showing you these verses if you come from a Christian background. Like there's a very powerful verse in Matthew chapter 9, verse 3 and 4 from the contemporary English version where the Jews observe that Christ forgives the sins of a paralytic man. And they, when they observe that, they think upon themselves that Jesus must think he is God. Because essentially only God can forgive sins. But when, they, when Christ observes what they're thinking, because he's got the faculty to do so, then he says to them of that thought, why do you think such evil things? Why do you think such evil things? Meaning, you thinking that I am God is an evil thought. Matthew chapter 9 verses 3 onwards. Are you following what I'm saying to you? Yeah. yeah. If you don't, just stop me and say I didn't understand that. So what we basically say is that God is unique. God sends messengers, prophets, and He guides mankind. Do you know we must we pray five times a day? Yeah. Do you know the actions we perform? We bow first, and we kneel in prostration. That's something even prophets used to do in the Old Testament. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 4 and 6, they bow before God, and then they kneeled in prostration, like the way we do. Put our heads to the head to the and the nose to the ground, and prostrate and worship God. Before we do a little, we, before we do these five daily prayers, we do a little wash, wash our hands, finish by washing our feet. That's also something which was the the practice of Moses as well in Deuteronomy. So what Islam invokes is that there's only one God. One day we're going to die. We're going to be accountable to Him, and we have to then resonate that Creator in our lives and worshipping God alone. So the Prophet Muhammad, who you may have heard of, he's be upon him, he's just a messenger of God. Just like Jesus, Moses, Abraham and all those prophets that you will be familiar with. How does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Excellent. So, what would compel you to know about Islam further? Um, I don't know. You don't know? Yeah. What are you were saying, like, does make sense though. Excellent. So, what we can do when one minute finish we discuss it, I can give you a free copy of the Quran in English, just behind you there. We've got that little, can you see that little um, table we got there with that sign, free Quran English translation. I'll give you, I'll give you a copy of that when we finish. And um, yeah, you can read through it, see what you think. Um, so yeah, would you like that? Would you like the little Quran as a little gift? Excellent. Okay, let me give that to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your time. Take care. Bye bye. Take care. So, mashallah, I speak to a nice young lady over here who um, was presenting herself as a Christian. So, we do what we usually do, we speak, we reason with them, we re make reference to their scriptures, we make reference to the Islamic perspective, and we don't want to inundate them with information either. But Alhamdulillah, by the will of Allah, slowly, slowly, when people read it, if they have an open heart, Allah then guides those who are sincere, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.